Russ Thomas, and I'm the CEO of the Prostate Forum of Orange County. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce you to Dr. Joel Gelman. Dr. Gelman is a specialist in male urethral and penile genital surgery. Dr. Gelman is the director of the Center of Reconstructive Urology and an associate clinical professor in the Department of Urology at the University of California, Irvine. Dr. Gelman completed his urology residency at the UCL, UCLA Medical Center and a fellowship in adult and pediatric male genitourinary reconstruction at the Divine Center in Norfolk, Virginia. When Dr. Gelman arrived at UC Irvine in 1998, there were no doctors in Southern California who were fellowship trained or exclusively specialized in the treatment of conditions such as urethral strictures. Once at UCI, UCI Dr. Gelman developed a Center for Reconstructive Urology exclusively devoted to the treatment of male urethral and penal disorders, including urethral stricture, disease and trauma, Peyronie's disease and other disease disorders of penile curvature, including hypospadias. Hypospadias, wow, I had to Google that one. This, this man has so much education, I don't even know what he does. But what Google says is that hypospadias is a birth defect of the penis involving the urethra. In hypospadias, the urethra does not go all the way through the penis, but instead opens on the underside of the shaft of the penis, or below the penis. Dr. Gelman specializes in complications of prostate cancer treatment, including urethral rectal fistulas, incontinence with artificial urinary sphincter placement, and erectile dysfunction with emphasis on penile implant surgery. Under the leadership of Dr. Gelman, the Center for Reconstructive Urology is now a regional, national, and international referral center treating patients who travel from many states outside of California and other countries specifically to receive their care by Dr. Gelman. To date, over 200 urologists, including faculty at all other major university medical centers in Los Angeles and other areas of Southern California, have referred patients to Dr. Gelman for his expertise. Tonight, Dr. Gelman will present the concepts and outcomes of treating the various complications and side effects, which are sometimes a consequence of surgical and radiation procedures. In addition to urinary incontinence and erectile dysfunction, he will address several other complications, such as urethral stricture, ladder neck contracture, and rectal fistula. He is an expert with the penile prosthesis for ED and the artificial sphincter procedures for urinary incontinence. It is our pleasure tonight to present to you Dr. Joel Gelb. Thank you very much for inviting me to this forum. I've been looking forward to this meeting for some time. Uh, to speak with you about a subject I don't uh, talk about quite as often as urethral stricture disease from other causes, and that's the uh, treatment of prostate cancer uh, surgery and radiation complications. Uh, I'd like to start with a disclaimer, which is something that's done at national meetings in our urology society, where those who are speaking have to disclose their financial relationships. That's often posted. Uh, in the manuals uh, that we receive when we attend meetings, but often when speakers give talks, that's not mentioned, and when things are mentioned on the internet, uh, you often don't see the disclosure of the financial interests involved. Uh, I can tell you that I have no financial interests in any drug company, any uh, product manufacturer, anybody that makes peanut implants, I have no conflicts of interest. And, uh, I make less money 
because I don't have money from that source. But what I hope I get in return is the ability to be perceived as unbiased when I give talks, uh, because I'm not being paid to have a certain orientation. Uh, so I have no funding source, if you will. But although I have no, no bias for financial reasons, I perhaps do have some bias uh, for personal reasons and because of what I encounter. In my own practice, I don't treat prostate cancer. I don't do surgery, I don't do radiation. I learned that in my training, but uh, about 15 or so years ago, I specialized in urethral and penile surgery, and uh, in order to specialize, you have to give up things, or else you're really not a specialist. Uh, if you're specialized in everything, then, then you know, you, you, you're not specialized really in anything. Uh, and I have a very biased view because of what I see. I would have to say the worst complications I see are from radiation treatment compared to surgery, especially with the robot. And so I could have a bias against radiation, for example, or hyper, where I see disasters. But I want to clarify that even though I may have that bias because of what I see, I also recognize that I don't see the success. I don't see the patients who have radiation who avoid surgery and have absolutely no problems. So it's really hard for me to come to any conclusions about one treatment versus another because of that bias in my own experience. Um, I also don't see uh, the complications of patients who don't get treated for prostate cancer because whenever you have to decide on a treatment, you have to think about the alternatives. And one alternative is always observation. If somebody's being observed for prostate cancer, maybe if they didn't have treatment, they would have died for prostate cancer. And that's not fun either. So I, I, don't, I don't see that. Uh, I don't see the successes or the failures uh, of treatment versus no treatment with regard to the cancer. All I really see is the patients who come to me, and the ones who come to me happen to have some of the most severe complications. And so I wanted to mention that, that personal bias and fact that uh, I, I don't have a balanced perspective, uh, so I shouldn't be drawing conclusions about whether radiation or surgery is best, or whether treatment versus no treatment. Really what I want to focus on for the rest of this talk is when people do have these complications, what can be done? And if somebody's considering treatment, though, I think it's very important to give consent that they understand that these are risks are very real. They may not be likely to happen, but if they do, it can be a very life-changing event in terms of quality of life, and uh, these changes can be very, uh, very permanent. Uh, now, the treatment options, of course, for prostate cancer, in addition to observation, watchful waiting, active surveillance, and hormonal therapy are surgery, external beam radiation therapy, radioactive seed implantation, high-frequency focused ultrasound, also called HIFU, uh, there's also cryoablation, and uh, uh, the most common treatment complications that you're probably familiar with are erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence. Uh, but in addition, the less common complications can include bladder neck contracture, which is a narrowing of where the bladder meets the prostate, or a urethral stricture, which is a narrowing of the urethra at some other point other than the bladder neck itself. They're both narrowing. But when it's at the point where the bladder meets the prostate, it, prostate it's specifically called in terminology a bladder neck contractor. Whereas if it's anywhere else in the urethra, it's generally referred to as a urethral stricture. Another less common complication more often seen with radiation, especially a combination of seeds and external beam radiation therapy, is a fistula. And a rectal urethral fistula is defined as an abnormal communication where the urinary tract and the GI tract communicate. So you have stool moving towards the urinary tract into the urethra, and vice versa, you could have urine exiting the rectum. And that's, that's a hole basically communicating, causing communication between two structures that are supposed to be separate. And the word fistula really in general means that. If there's a connection between the skin and the urethra, for example, that's called urethra cutaneous, where cutaneous means the skin. It's just the terminology, meaning a communication or a connection that shouldn't exist. And in the case of prostate cancer treatment, one thing that can happen, which can also happen after surgery, is a fistula, between, a connection between the urinary and bowel tracts. Uh, with 
regard to erectile dysfunction, one that causes major concern, uh, as you may know, the nerves uh, related to erectile function happen to course right adjacent to the prostate. And here's a picture of the prostate uh, with a black arrow pointing to the area just behind the prostate, which is a typical area where those nerves can be injured. Um, now, of course, men develop erectile dysfunction with some frequency, even in the absence of prostate cancer treatment. And whether there's erectile dysfunction from prostate cancer treatment or maybe due to diabetes or high blood pressure, uh, really the treatment options are very similar. Uh, so the treatment options can include oral medications such as Viagra, Levitra, uh, Cialis. Uh, then there's the use of a vacuum pump, a pump that actually places over the penis, creating a vacuum leading to rigidity. There's a medicine that actually can be deposited in the tip of the urethra that's a vascular uh, agent, which means it acts directly on the penis to promote relaxation of the blood vessels, leading to more blood flow into the penis. There's injection therapy where through a tiny needle, instead of injecting insulin into the body, uh, a man injects through the tiny needle a small amount of medication directly into the base of the penis that acts on the penis to promote blood flow, causing an erection, and that's called injection therapy. And then there's also the option of a penile implant, also called a penile prosthesis. The approach that's most common is not to do many tests, because it doesn't really change management. And whenever you're having any tests for any reason, there's always some, often usually some invasiveness involved. There's cost involved, there's time, there can be discomfort. And so whenever you have a test done, uh, even a blood test, uh, it should be in it to change the management. It should be to give you information to help decide what to do. Whereas if it shows one thing, you do one thing. If it shows something else, you do something else. Uh, in the case of erectile dysfunction, these tests don't necessarily change your management. And so special ultrasound, equivalent of arteriography for the penis isn't really commonly performed in these cases. Really the approach is to discuss all options and hopefully find the least invasive treatment that produces the desired result. The least invasive treatment is oral medication. Now you take a pill and if that uh, helps or that solves the problem, then that's usually what most people will do. Uh, if that fails, that's when more and more people come from their primary care doctors to a urologist. And one option that's relatively non-invasive is a vacuum pump, and this is a picture of that pump. And that pump fits over the penis, and if you look towards the right of your screen, you'll see a part sticking upward, and if you repeatedly depress that, it actually creates a vacuum inside the cylinder, promoting blood flow to the penis to produce an erection. When you remove the pump, that erection may subside if there's any loss of blood uh, from the penis through a leak through the veins, in which case you can put constricting rings on uh, at the base of the penis to produce a constriction. What's nice about this? No medicine, no surgery, easy thing to try. Very important to know how to use this device properly and to be educated in the proper use of this device in order to have the highest chance of success, which is true of anything. And uh, some people find this very effective. Some people would say over 80 percent. But uh, some people would also find it cumbersome. They don't like the idea of having to use this device. If they use these rings, they may find that uh, there's some pinching, some discomfort from some numbness of the penis, and they may, they may or may not like this. But that's a reasonable option to try. Um, use is, well, the medication is called a prostadil, but it's a medicine that's deposited uh, if you look on the left, you'll see the round part of this, and if you squeeze on that round part at the other end, towards your right, a little pellet will come out into the urethra, and that'll actually be absorbed and act onto the penis to help promote blood flow. The good news is this may be a very nicely effect, uh, a nice option. Uh, the bad news is that the effectiveness is not as high as injection therapy, and there can be some irritation to the urethra as one possible but it's an option. Moving on to the more invasive option, you have injection therapy. And I think this is a very nice option uh, for 
people to consider, especially before an implant. Many people tolerate injections into the penis very well through a tiny needle. It's not into the head of the penis, it's into the base of the penis. It's through a very tiny needle. You can adjust the medications to have it so that the medicine itself doesn't necessarily produce pain. It produces an erection within five to 10 minutes. It can be injected in a restroom so that when the man exits the restroom, then the erection develops naturally. And the erection itself is normal with regard to length and the engorgement of the head of the penis, which are all desirable uh, things. Uh, some people, I believe, don't have success with this method because they're not taught properly. If I'm going to treat a patient with injection therapy, I want them to understand how to uh, throw off the medication. It used to be that uh, Pfizer had more things involved like in this picture where you just push a button, but those devices, they don't make anymore. So more and more now, people have to actually drop their own medications and have to learn how to do that. If you use a tiny needle and you withdraw, you may have an air bubble, and if you're injecting air, then you're not going to get a very good result. You may think, oh, this medicine doesn't work. Well, maybe it's because it's not being injected. And so I teach people how to drop the medication. I show them how to inject, and then I watch them do it to make sure they know how to do it and how to properly uh, dose this. Uh, this is a very common treatment option offered at the Boston Medical Group, if you're familiar with that. They have received some recent press. Uh, but uh, there's some criticism about that group offering injections preferentially. I do think it's an option, but I think like with everything, it shouldn't be favored over at least less invasive options such as oral medication if that's effective and desired by the patient. Um, the medication cost is not really all that high. Uh, there could be a conflict of interest if the doctor is selling the medication and profiting from it uh, and, and promoting a particular treatment, especially if it's at a profit margin. Uh, I don't sell medication. I, I have to get it from the pharmacy where there's no money for me. And so I, I think that people can get that from a pharmacy and not have to pay a very high price. Uh, and that can be a very nice option. If that fails or is not a good option, then you're looking at a penile implant as a very nice option. People ask me, well, what do you think about penile implants? And I say it's the wonderful option for the properly counseled patient who really believes from experience and trial and error of other options that this is really the best option. The properly counseled patient who has realistic expectations should be very, very happy with this device. Uh, now this is an example of a malleable penile implant. It's like a gooseneck gland. It's semi-rigid. It never changes. It just bends up and down. It has some partial rigidity at all times. It's the simplest device to implant. It was very common when I was a resident in training. Uh, but it doesn't deflate. And so there's always some rigidity, which means there could be some discomfort. Uh, maybe a higher risk of erosion. And where it goes, is here. Here's a cross section of the penis. You'll see the urethra below, and I drew some arrows. It actually goes under the skin, but in the space of the penis itself, uh, the penis is somewhat like a rubber balloon, sort of like partially divided into two parts, where you have rubber and then you have water. And instead of the rubber balloon, you have a structure of a casing that's more rigid called tunica albuginia that somebody named it, and inside of it, you have a vascular spongy tissue that fills with blood instead of the rubber balloon that fills with water. And within the inside of the penis itself is where these cylinders go, uh, one on each side. And the rigidity of that allows penetration. It's not the same as a normal erection because these cylinders don't extend into the head of the penis or the glands penis. And so the head of the penis will be floppy. Moreover, when you're doing a penile implant, the length that's achieved is really the same as the stretched penile length. So if you take the head of the penis and pinch it with your fingers and pull on it just so it's a little bit under tension, that's really the length you could expect with the penile implant, whereas a normal erection, there's more expansion of the tissues and the length is longer. So if a person is really expecting, sometimes when people have implants, they think they're going to get a bigger penis as a bonus. And 
if they have that expectation, they're going to be unhappy. Even if it's their expectation to have the same length as they had before, they're going to be unhappy. But if they understand and appreciate that they've tried other options that have failed, and it's better to have a penis that's not as long as it once was, but it can be used for intercourse, whereas now, at the current situation, it can't be, and that patient's going to be happy. And that's why counseling is so very important. Uh, in addition to a semi-rigid implant, one option is called an Amacor. This is made by the company AMS. They're the only company that makes it. Uh, and it's a two-piece device, if you will. It has the cylinders, but it also has a pump. And the pump contains fluid, and so when you squeeze on the pump, it'll actually transfer a small amount of fluid to make it just a little bit more rigid. And then when you bend the device, it actually transfers the fluid out of that compartment to make it a little softer. What's nice about this is it doesn't have that third piece that I'll explain in a minute, so there's less of a mechanical uh, contraction involved in the placement of it. Uh, but you don't have the same degree of uh, flaccidity. In other words, when it's deflated, it's still relatively semi-rigid. But that's one option. Not as that common, the more common, the most common, option is really called a three-piece implant. And this is a device made by both AMS and a company called Coloplast, formerly Mentor. And this device is a three-piece. Now, where you see the arrow is the pump. That pump is placed internal. Everything's under the skin. It's placed under the scrotum, between the testicles. And when you squeeze on that pump, fluid transfers from this reservoir that's placed in the abdomen next to the bladder, so you can't feel it. It's transferred from this reservoir through the tubing, through the pump, into the cylinders. And here you can see the cylinders on your left. And you can see they're sort of deflated. You don't see them quite full, not quite round. Here, you can see, if you look at the cylinders, they're more round and inflated. And that's because when you squeeze on the, on the pump, it transfers fluid from that reservoir into the cylinders. And then, when you push on this part of the pump and squeeze it, it then transfers the fluid back from the cylinders back into the reservoir. So you repeatedly squeeze on the pump and it transfers fluid and then the penis becomes rigid. When you push a button, it transfers the fluid out of the cylinders into that reservoir, allowing the penis to become soft. And that's how the phenomenon that works. And that's a wonderful option because if other things are unacceptable that would work, this allows somebody to have intercourse that otherwise wouldn't be able to. So that's, that's a nice option. Uh, it, it's not required that the patient will die if they don't have it. So there has to be some motivation, of course, to have this done and a recognition of the limitations and the potential risks. Uh, I think the biggest complication risk of this is infection because if the implant becomes infected, you can't just get antibiotics, the implant has to be removed, and then a patient had two surgeries and still doesn't have an implant that to show for it. Uh, but the infection rate is relatively low. Um, this is the implant made by AMS, uh, very similar, uh, difference in some materials, some minor differences. Those who are paid by one company tend to favor that product, those who are paid by the other company, coincidentally, uh, favor the, the other product. Uh, I use both. I, 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 uh, I don't have a personal bias. Uh, there's certain things I like about one versus the other. Uh, I haven't really formed an opinion to say that one is, is truly better than, better than the other. But I like the cylinders by the Cold Glass Company. Uh, there are some features of the uh, pump I like by AMS, but then they uh, changed it. So they're always making little changes trying to make a better product. Uh, but the bottom line is they're both very nice products, really. Now, moving on from erectile dysfunction to incontinence, which is the other of the two common complications of one years ago with prostate cancer treatment, there are several options. One is wearing diapers and taking medication uh, to relax the bladder, even though it's not a problem with the bladder, we believe. Uh, another option is to do Kegel exercises, which uh, may help strengthen the sphincter, but don't necessarily uh, cure a, a problem if there's been damage to the sphincter.
cancer, but no harm in people exercising their recommended routinely after prostate cancer treatment. I have no reason to suggest to you that they're not uh, some benefit. Uh, but when the incontinence is persistent and relatively severe and the patient's motivated, then there are options. The gold standard has been for many years uh, the use of a um, artificial sphincter. And an artificial sphincter is a device that wraps around the urethra. And here's a picture of it in place. You see the cuff, which is really a device that encircles the urethra. And then you also have a pump that's under the skin and the scrotum, and you also have a reservoir. In this case, though, when you squeeze on the pump, what it does is it removes fluid from the cuff that's pinching on the urethra and puts it into the reservoir to open up that area. So if a man wants to urinate, he squeezes it on the cuff, and as the cuff deflates and opens up, that creates a channel so that when the man squeezes his bladder, urine goes through without impairment, and then over time, on its own, that cuff then slowly refills due to some pressure difference, and then it squeezes on the urethra. And now, this is an operation that's very effective in many cases with severe incontinence. Once it's activated after surgery, it's like a night and day difference for many men who are socially incapacitated by severe leakage. It's a nice thing. What's bad about it in some ways is you're really uh, not treating the underlying problem. The underlying problem is you have something higher up that's not working. And what you're doing is you're pinching on something that's perfectly normal down below to sort of compensate. It's like if you have a main water line in the faucet that just won't shut off. And then what do you do is you, you squeeze the hose really hard to, uh, to stop the water from flowing. Uh, where the problem, the reason there's flow is not because there's a problem with the hose, which is just the conduit. The problem is that it's a main water line. But there's no good solution to make a faulty sphincter work. So this is sort of a workaround. And, but it's a very good workaround. And it's a wonderful option for men with incontinence. This is only an option if, they, if, the, if there's no narrowing of the urethra anywhere. So if somebody actually has some narrowing of the urethra, that's considered a contraindication to putting in one of these devices. Uh, what's good about this? It treats incontinence very, very effectively in a high percentage of patients, and the complication rate, if it's done properly, is relatively low. But everybody has to be counseled that there are certain risks, and one risk can be injury to the urethra, where then the cuff, the cuff and the whole device would have to be removed. Like with an implant, if there's an infection, then the device has to be removed. I've seen urethral injuries from this in strictures. Uh, over time, if you squeeze on the urethra, that can damage the urethra because it's sort of like a chronic tourniquet. And you can have atrophy of the urethra. And as the tissue surrounding the urethra withers a little bit, then it coacts or collapses less effectively. And then you can have some incontinence even though you have that sphincter cuff wrapped around the urethra, and then some people try to do redo surgery to replace it, or try to add a second cuff, or try to incorporate some other tissue near the urethra into it to bulk it up to have better compression of the urethra. Uh, but this is a very nice option in a properly counseled patient. Newer techniques that I don't have time to discuss include what's called male slings made by both of these companies, AMS and uh, Coloplast, and they all have different and slight uh, mechanics and materials and how they're uh, placed. But what they do is compress the urethra. So they sort of put pressure on the urethra to try to pinch it closed with the idea that when the bladder squeezes, that pressure from the squeezing overcomes that pressure on the urethra so that the man can urinate. It's generally considered a reasonable option for relatively mild incontinence, but not necessarily for significant four or five pads a day incontinence. Uh, and impotence and incontinence are often treated by general urologists in the community. And, uh, but then there's other problems that uh, generally aren't treated uh, in the community, and that's really a significant portion of my practice because most of my patients come from other urologists when they develop these particular problems uh, where the management of these problems is really a highly specialized area of urology. And that's the treatment of things such as bladder neck contractors and urethral strictures. And that's what I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about today also. Uh, but to really understand this, you have to really 
uh, appreciate a little bit of the anatomy. And whenever I see patients, I give them a mini anatomy lesson so they can understand the issues involved. Because it's not as straightforward as strictures from other causes. When I see patients with urethral strictures, and let's say that he's out of lumbar urethra, which is the part of the urethra you can see on this diagram that mostly just represents a tube. And a tube is narrow. And if I can make that narrow tube wide, I've cured my patient. And I can do that with an extremely high success rate. In many cases, greater than 98%. I can do a single operation and fix them permanently. What helps me is that this area of the urethra is very accessible. I can get to the bulbar urethra, let's say that area, which is the urethra under the scrotum by a skin incision, and very soon I'm at the bulbar urethra. It's not deep in the pelvis. I don't have to worry about sphincters because this part of the urethra is just a tube. It doesn't have anything to do with the continents. So I don't have those issues involved. It's accessible, no continents, and so that's something I can fix with a very high success rate. Uh, but when people come to me, with very severe complications of prostate cancer treatment, I want to make clear to them that if they have this expectation that I'm capable of fixing with this high success rate, that that's really for a different problem. This doesn't apply to some of the things that I see with prostate cancer treatment. And so that's an important so people understand that uh, I am not promoting that I can fix prostate cancer treatment complications, especially some of the most severe ones with a single procedure, the 98 plus success rate, that's, that's not true. Um, now, if there's urethral blockage, which I said is a narrowing in the urethra somewhere, which if it's at the bladder neck, or where the bladder meets the prostate, by the way, I'll go back to this slide. Here you can see the bladder neck. Let's just review this for just a moment. If, uh, if you look from top to bottom, you see the bladder, right? And then you see the prostate. Well, the prostate is connected to the bladder, and that connection is called the bladder neck. And urine travels normally through the prostate. It's like a hole in the middle, like a donut or a bagel, if you will. Where the prostate is the donut or the bagel, and the urethra is the hole in the middle with the lining of cells. And urine travels through there. And then once it travels through there, it, it reaches a portion called the membranous urethra. Now, some people call that the sphincter, or the external sphincter, and that's where there is a sphincter. But it's not the only sphincter. The bladder neck is a sphincter. The membranous urethra is a sphincter. There are two sphincters. There's also some intrinsic sphincters, but for this discussion, think of it in simple terms. There's two sphincters. The bladder neck, the membranous urethra. One's on one side of the prostate, near the bladder, and the other is on the other side of the prostate. It's like your main water line in your faucet. And it works very similar uh, like in, in, in that fashion because if you have the main water line shut off, there's not going to be any leakage through your faucet. If the faucet's on or off, it doesn't matter, right? If your main water line is on and it can't shut off, and you can, your faucet's working, you can shut off the water. You have two ways of turning on and turning off water. You only need one, really. The one's just a backup. It's like that. Uh, with normal male anatomy. You have to have at least one word. Okay. And then the rest of the urethra, from the membranous urethra to the tip of the penis, is basically a hose or a tube. It just has to be open to, to there not be blockage. So now when you go on to urethral blockage, often this is a patient who's maybe had prostate cancer or treatment of some sort, and then there's some symptoms of blockage, difficulty to urinate, slow stream, Stream, pushing to urinate, uh, dribbling, starts and stops, sensation of fullness, doesn't feel like the bladder is emptying quite well. Those are all considered obstructive symptoms. And uh, what happens is eventually at some point the patient will see a urologist who will then look at the scope. And when you look at the scope, it's like looking down a tunnel, but then you come to a pinpoint narrow of a stricture with the scope. And then what does that tell you? Well, at that point in time, what you know is the appearance of the urethra up to the point, or distal, or up to the point of the stricture. You can see how it looks until you get to the stricture. You can see 
the caliber of the distal aspect of the stricture. And what that means is where the stricture starts, you can see how narrow it is at that point. And you get some general idea where the stricture is by how far you have to go in to get to that point, right? That's what you know. What you don't know is the exact location of that relative to the other side. You don't know the true length, but you see where it stops, but you don't see where it becomes normal on the other side because you can't get through. And you don't know if there's multiple strictures or a separate stricture upstream because you're, you're stopped at that point. And then at that point, when somebody has blockage, there's two options. You can do more testing to try to find out the answer to these questions as to exactly how long it is if there's multiple. Or you can do treatment. And treatment can be where you stretch it to get through, you cut it to get through, you open it up and put some sort of stent in, you can do some open surgery to try to fix it. Uh, and to dilate the urethra, you can use the scope by ramming it through, using the scope as a dilating tool. Or you can insert instruments that stretch or then often tear the urethra. There's various instruments that do that, and that's really treatment. And most patients that come to me for strictures have been treated without having the imaging done. And that's not my approach. Uh, my approach would be if there's a stricture to be encountered to find out more information because I said in an early part of the talk that you don't do tests unless it changes the management in general, but this does change the management because if the stricture's long, it may be treated differently than if the stricture's short. If I'm going to dilate the stricture and that stricture is relatively long, I need to let that patient know to counsel him that the treatment is generally going to be temporary and not a permanent cure of the, of the narrowing. It's, it's just a management tool to provide temporary improvement of symptoms. And so what I offer patients, often for the first time after multiple treatments, is urethral imaging. And I do this all myself. I'm sad and fortunate that I've done over a thousand of them. And, uh, I have a complete setup, the luxury of that, since I specialize in this, to have my own technician, uh, imaging equipment, uh, the ability to print, to save it as images, to show their patient uh, images and do it all at the same initial visit. Uh, and with that imaging, I can very precisely determine the length of the stricture, the location, and the relationship to those sphincters. And this is done with the patient in the oblique position, which means they're tilted to their side, and it's going to be done on a simple gurney, and this is the room we use. It's with very simple equipment, we have a syringe with contrast. Now that looks clear on the picture, it looks like water, but on an x-ray image it shows a bright white. We have just a little bit of gauze, a little bit of lubrication, and some soap, and that's really mostly what we use. Here's the adapter that goes on the tip, and it just goes into the tip of the urethra. I'd say over 90% of the imaging studies that are done use a balloon that's put in the urethra and inflated to make a seal. And I think that's a terrible technique because it damages normal urethra and it can be a painful procedure and it's not, it's not as useful. Uh, so if there's no benefit to that, it's just that people don't know better. Uh, and here's a, a, an adapter close up. And this is my own technique that I've been using for quite a few years. And this is how this works. You just take the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, you take the adapter and you screw it on the syringe and then I get a little bit of that contrast on the gauze so I can then see the gauze on the x-ray too. And I make it into a uh, knot. And I call that the penis noose. But it doesn't hurt to strangle it. And I, and I put the penis under tension. And then I put the contrast in. And then as I'm pulling on this, I slowly inject. And then here's a picture of that. Now if you look at this picture, this is called a retrograde urethrogram. And it's an x-ray image of the urethra showing in nice detail the outline of the urethra. And this will be useful. I'm going to mostly show you strictures not related to prostate cancer treatment, but show you how that information then makes sense when we talk about prostate cancer treatment complications. So here's a view of the urethra. Now, here's the penis piece, okay? So that shows up on the x-ray as I put some contrast on it. So that's where the head of the penis meets the rest of the penis, right? Because you saw how that went on. So that orients you where the head of the penis is. And the first half of this towards your left is the part of the urethra that goes within the penis. 
The other half, as you see, uh, outlined really well, is called the bulbar urethra, which is the part that goes under the scrotum. Now you see it narrow here, right? Is that a stricture? No. Now, some radiologists that are misguided, they call it a stenosis or a narrowing, but it, you can't tell. It's narrow. It's supposed to be narrow because this is where that external sphincter is. And that external sphincter is always pinching except when somebody's urinating. When I'm injecting, the man's not urinating, so it's supposed to be closed. That's a good thing. Same with this other second sphincter over here called the bladder neck. Now the area in between is where the prostate is. That little dimple or what's called filling defect in the middle is like a little protrusion within the prostate that shows up that way. Uh, now, if I were an artist and I could draw the external sphincter on this picture, that's where it would be. So it's pinching it to be narrow. That's normal. And there's the prostate, okay? So this actually shows the functional anatomy that I showed you previously of the prostate and that sphincter. If somebody has a stricture within, let's say, the bulbar urethra, that's where this would be. You see? And then you take that away. So I can see that cone-shaped departure of that anterior urethra and figure that's probably normal. Uh, but the urethral strictures in just the part where it's a tube, I know that has nothing to do with sphincters. So if I can take that stricture and repair that by making it wider or there's enough mobility, in this case I could cut out the stricture and put the two ends back together, that patient should have no problem and should not have incontinence because even if I damage the one, it would be the other and I'm not going to either, right? So that's, uh, that's nice. That's very rewarding because I can fix just about everybody with a stricture like that. That's a chip shot. Um, uh, now, if somebody, if I, when I do this imaging, I can't do this if somebody's been recently dilated. There was somebody at a major other hospital that was supposed to have surgery and a catheter in Sharifa. And I said, I can't do your surgery because I don't think I'll know where the stricture is. And let's just do an x-ray to see. And I took his catheter out, and here's his x-ray. I have no idea where a stricture is, but it was so aggressive, he couldn't go three months, which is what I normally make people wait to really see where the, to have it defined. So we put a tube directly in the bladder to allow that urethra to rest. Three months later, same patient. So now I can see it. So sometimes the, the one pearl, if you will, when I'm doing these tests is that you do it after somebody's been recently dilated or treated or had a catheter, you may underestimate the severity. It gives you information, but not, not everything. Uh, so in general, I like to do imaging three months after instrumentation. I can do preliminary imaging, but I can't count on the, uh, the, the, that showing the whole picture unless I wait. And they may have to have a tube in their bladder in the intro. Now, what's good about this imaging is it tells you a lot about that anterior urethra, which is the part that's just a tube, but it's very bad for telling you about the posterior urethra, and that's where the sphincter is and where that bladder neck is, and why is that? Well, it's narrow, but you don't know if it's narrow because it's normally narrow, or, you don't, or, you, or it could be narrow because there's a fixed blockage in there and it's not capable of opening up, which is an obstruction. And what you need to know about that portion of the urethra is a test called a VCUG, which stands for voiding cystourethrogram, which is an x-ray taken as the patient's urinating. Most of the studies that are done have the injection, but not the voiding film. Uh, it takes a lot of time to do the voiding film when somebody's narrow, because you have to very slowly fill them up. And some people will try to put a catheter in and fill them up, but if the catheter goes in without damage, there's not a problem, but usually they have that problem, so you're gonna damage the patient to get the information. So you have to fill very slowly. And unfortunately, Medicare pays zero extra for people to do both studies. They sort of reward incomplete studies and punish somebody under their system who takes 10 times the amount of time to get the complete study. And for whatever reason, whether it's because of that or other reasons, most studies aren't complete imaging studies. Um, now, here's the example of that BCUG on this patient with that bulbar stricture. And here, if I could superimpose, look at the area now. Look at the membrane in this sphincter area. Look at that bladder neck. See how wide that's open? Really wide. So from doing this extra study, I know that that portion of the urethra opens and closes normally. 
And if you look at them side by side, here's that bull bar stricture on both studies. And well, this is narrow here. I know from the other study that it's really open when the patient's urinating. So that's normal and that patient just has what's called a bulbar stricture. Here's another patient, very typical. And usually people get these strictures. This is the young patient from sort of straddling three bicycle bars, getting hit, something like that. And when that patient, there's the stricture here, when the patient urinates, look how that's even blown over wider from the high pressure from all the blockage beyond it. But clearly that portion is normal. And many of the times that's uh, normal. Uh, but uh, the reason we do the BCUG is because sometimes there's problems upstream in that posterior urethra, especially people with prostate cancer treatment. So here's a rug, which is a retrograde urethra, which is that injection study showing the stricture. And if you look at it close up, you'll see that's a two and a half centimeter stricture. And this over here is that normal cone shape. It looks pretty normal in terms of the contour. But if I do the two studies side by side, and here's that bulbar stricture, and here on the injection it's narrow, hey, that area is also narrow when the patient's urinating. This patient has a bulbar and membranous stricture. Now, let's say I were to fix this stricture and would require destroying this membranous urethra because it's narrow and to fix it, I have to remove that area. I've damaged their sphincter. Are they, is the patient going to be incontinent? The answer is probably not because that bladder neck, that main water line is working, right? And I can even see that if you look at the study side by side. If you look at that part near the bladder neck, you'll see it's open on the left. It's, excuse me, it's closed on the left when the patient's not urinating, uh, but opens up only when they're urinating. So, not a problem. Now let's move on with that background to the prostate treatment complications, which I'll conclude with. Here's an example of uh, imaging performed on a patient that had high food, high intensity focused ultrasound. Uh, one thing to understand, not to introduce a bias, but I started to look at the uh, websites promoting this for people to go out of the country to have this uh, minimally invasive treatment option. And I see the advertisements indicating how it's painlessly, uh, precisely targets the prostate cancer and harmlessly uh, goes through the adjacent tissues, sparing the uh, normal tissues. And it sounds very elegant where without doing anything in really invasive, you can actually selectively just kill the cancer cells and cause no other problems. And maybe that happens, and again, I don't see the type of success, but I see this. That's a total obliteration from the bladder neck all the way through the sphincter, both sphincters, if you will, uh, for sure, no question. That's a really serious problem. That patient can't urinate at all. So it should, uh, to counsel somebody, you should always mention all the things that can go wrong even though they might not. And so if somebody's giving informed consent to have hypo, they should understand that this can happen. I don't know the frequency of what it happens. Maybe it's just one of those, maybe I just happen to see the only complications that ever occur. But, uh, but it can happen. Uh, so this is a patient who had prostate radiation and he was sent to me for a stricture towards the tip. Now if somebody's dilated, one thing they can have because of the complication of the instruments, especially large instruments going through the tip of the penis, is something called the fossa stricture, which is a stricture where the head of the penis meets the body, which is there. So he was being referred for that. Now, I could have just done that retrograde radiogram, but especially with the history of radiation, and even in the absence of that, I always do complete imaging, and lo and behold, his most nerve stricture is right there. Look, when he goes to urinate, how that still stays very, very narrow. This patient required two surgeries. He required treatment of his fossa, that stricture towards the tip of the penis, but also that membrane of Now, will this patient be incontinent? Well, probably not, because that bladder neck is opening and closing nicely. Look how wide open it is on the film on your right, and how it's nicely closed on the left. Is it perfectly closed? Can I guarantee the patient that they're not going to have incontinence? No. But it's not likely. But what's for sure is the patient is highly obstructed. As you can see, it's just a pinpoint that uh, he's urinating through. So for sure, the patient has a problem without treatment. 
And that's how some of the decisions are made, even though there's certain risks, the risks are greater with not doing something. Um, and so here's another patient who had seeds. Can you see the seeds? The densities in the area of the prostate? That's what they look like on x-ray. And this patient, if you look, you'll see that narrowing uh, outlined in the yellow. But you can also most importantly know that the bladder neck seems to open and close. And that's really useful in patients like this because if there's two areas of blockage, like two kinks in that garden pose we talked about, and I can just fix one, that's not going to really help the patient if they have the other kink, right? So I don't want to have a surprise of doing a major open surgery and be technically successful with that, only to have the patient still obstructed because there's another blockage where have to benefit of the one stretcher to the patient that would. Uh, but in this case, that's not true. This patient only has one area. So if I can cut out the bad part and put the joints back together, and the patient has another contact mechanism, uh, the, everyone wins. Uh, this is a bladder neck contracture where you see this area is narrow now. Maybe that's narrow because it's normally closed because this is an injection study. But when the patient urinates, that area still doesn't really open up. And also I can confirm that by placing a scope because the scope will make it all the way to that point, but then when we enter the bladder, then I can further confirm that this is real. Because there's a limitation in the study, maybe this patient's bladder neck didn't open up because during the time I took the film, he just wasn't able to relax, to urinate. When you urinate properly, you're supposed to not push. You're supposed to relax, to let those sphincters open as a reflex, a nerve, a nerve reflex, if you will. And sometimes patients just can't do that when they're on a procedure table. But in this case, if I look at the scope and it won't into the bladder because of the blockage in that area, well, then I made that uh, determination. Now, here's a problem if you see the seeds. Now, that's a little different. That's not necessarily just bladder neck versus membranous which is on each side of the prostate, and you can see there's a blockage within the prostate itself for seeds. You can see where that area gives you that orientation. You see the seeds surrounding it, and the blockage is right smack dab in the middle of all those seeds, right? And when you're reading, and that should make sense that somebody could get this with damage, because basically, when you put a lot of seeds into something, or radiate something, you, and you damage it and you have an opening in the middle, you can imagine that that could affect the hole in the middle. And in some cases, that does. And that's, that's, that's what happened. Now, this is another problem. If you look at the bladder, instead of being nice and smooth and round, you see that irregularity that's very severely deformed. It should be like a smooth ball. And when there's radiation damage, which doesn't generally happen with surgery, they can get actually what's called a contracted bladder or the damage to the bladder where it's under high pressure or when it goes to fill it's full after a very small amount is in the bladder, let's say let's say 100 cc's when it should hold several times that. And the bladder should normally store under low pressure, but when it's contracted, it stores under high pressure. And whenever the bladder is constantly under high pressure, that could actually cause a backup of urine from the bladder toward back towards the kidneys and cause kidney damage. So that's a dangerous situation. And if somebody has a contracted bladder, let's say, you don't want to put in a sphincter because the leakage of urine is what's stopping the bladder from being under more pressure. So maybe it'll stop the leakage, but the expense of kidney function. So, uh, and those are the things you have to think about when you have prostate cancer treatment complications. You see, there's several issues when I'm dealing with urethral strictures, which I see more commonly, I just know that if I make the tube wide, everything is fine. I don't have to deal with sphincters. I don't have to worry about how the bladder is functioning. But in this case, there can be more than one problem. And if you just treat one problem and you don't treat the other problem, there's not necessarily a benefit to the patient. So you have to look at the big picture. And then imaging helps me with that. And that's why I believe in the imaging before the treatment. Uh, here's a fistula. Now, this is actually an outline of bowel, which is what I mentioned before. And this can be a topic in itself, but this is a very devastating problem where you have to have urinary diversion, a colostomy, uh, and then you can do a reconstruction, actually, to separate the two and then take down the colostomy. But if there's also a stricture involved, you have to repair that. Uh, there could be incontinence, but then if you've done the surgery, it's harder to treat the incontinence 
later. It's a complicated problem, but these problems can be effectively treated. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to conclude with, I hope you found this useful, uh, is uh, a few examples of uh, and how they're managed. Uh, now, this is an obliteration of the bladder neck after a radical prostatectomy. If there's any separation of where the two ends are put together, when you remove the prostate, basically you're connecting the bladder to the membranous urethra, and that serves as the sphincter. You don't have two sphincters like you did before, you have one. Uh, and that's usually the membranous urethra, although you have some reconstruction of the bladder neck per se when you're putting things together. But if there becomes any scarring or narrowing after surgery, uh, or in that area for any reason, it's called a bladder neck contracture. If there's, if there's narrowing, it's called a contracture. If there's absolutely no connection between two points and there's a separation where there's zero connection, that's called an obliteration. There's no connection. And, uh, and there's the anatomy, if you will. So in order to treat this, what we really need to do is reestablish a connection. If you try to go through with instruments and try to poke through and core things out, usually that's not very effective. And sometimes you can't even find your way through if you have no channel. Uh, and so generally that's treated with open surgery, where you make it, you can come from below, you can come from above. In this case, we came from above. This can be done with robot surgery in some cases. And if it was that, I wouldn't do it. I'd have one of my colleagues at UCI do it because we have such outstanding uh, robot surgeons. Uh, we've done so many of them that uh, I think this is a very elegant way to do it. Um, and uh, here's an example of uh, one of our patients who came to us after uh, having a radical prostatectomy elsewhere and then had this problem that we repaired. Uh, the alternative would be to have a supercubic tube or two directly in the bladder because there's no way to urinate in the absence of an effective repair. Uh, so that's very possible. This can be effectively treated. It's a major surgery, but it's, it offers that potential. Uh, a membrane stricture after radiation is uh, something that I just treated last week uh, and many times before. And here's the patient when they're urinating. And this is the most wonderful thing to see in somebody with radiation uh, because it shows you how this, if you look at the two films here, you see how that bladder neck opens very widely and closes. And uh, so the prostate area is nice and smooth. So that means that if I can fix this area by removing that narrow area, even though I just, even though the disease, if you will, destroyed one of the sphincters, and I'm, I'm relieving the obstruction, I'm not going to necessarily create leakage because there's another uh, uh, sphincter there. And uh, it's not the best scenario because normally I like to connect healthy to healthy. And in this instance, I'm connecting that bulbar urethra to radiated prostate tissue. So it's not quite healthy on the other end. But nevertheless, this has been very effective for us. Uh, we, when I first started doing this, I wasn't sure what the outcomes would be. But now that, that we have many years of follow up, I've been very happy. Uh, the patient who had this particular surgery did a, a video on our website. That Experience. Uh, uh, so you hear the story, but before he had it, he was being dilated many times in the emergency rooms repeatedly, and that's a very typical scenario of people with obstruction. They're often managed with dilation and uh, incisions and struggle and come to the emergency rooms and have catheters and have tubes. And this patient would have had a supercubic tube because it couldn't even be effectively dilated anymore. Uh, but now it's had eight years of good uh, outcome. I can't promise that to everybody, but there's that potential, and the alternatives are very unfavorable uh, in these cases. And so here you can see the anatomy where the bladder neck is shown, and if that's preserved and working well, then that patient will be confident. And this is that patient after repair. Uh, as he's urinating, you can see the areas now watching the patient, and the different has remained that way. Uh, and then I'd like to mention a couple of other complex problems. One is bladder neck contracture that's recurrent. Typically when somebody, let's say, has a radical prostatectomy and you put the two ends together where you, there's been an asthmosis, you remove the prostate and then you have to get to put the bladder back to the urethra. Where that connection is made, if there's a narrowing, that's called a bladder neck contracture. I think the incidence of that has gone down significantly uh, with the advent of the robot. I think you can get a much nicer connection. I think when you have an experienced surgeon using a robot, 
the incidence is really low. Uh, at UC Irvine, I'm very fortunate to have colleagues with a lot of uh, uh, expertise with, with that particular operation. And because of that, I don't see many ladder net contractors from our own institution. Uh, so that's it's, it's a good thing. Um, when somebody gets that complication, which can happen even in the best of hands, uh, then usually they're treated with an incision. Could be a dilation, but if you're incising it, hoping that when you cut into that tissue, new healthy tissue will grow and it won't become narrow again. And that happens often. But sometimes it doesn't, and then it gets narrow again, and you cut it, or people resect it, and they're doing all these things through the urethra, trying to open it up. <coughs> some people have the misconception that sometimes when things are done to, re to treat scar tissue through the urethra, it's called removing the scar, or scraping out scar. Don't think of the urethra as a pipe, where there's crud inside the pipe, and it just needs to be scraped out. The narrowing is the pipe itself being narrow. So basically, if you remove the scar, you're removing the pipe. And uh, what you're doing in reality is, like, is you're revising the scar whenever you're doing these procedures. If you cut a scar, you make a new scar, which can be good. That's how things heal. Scars are how the body heals. You just don't want that scar to be narrow. The problem is not scar tissue. The problem is narrow, although there's some relationship. And uh, what you hope is that when you cut into that scar, new cells will grow so that it doesn't contract. Uh, but, but injuries, if you will, like to contract. And so that's where you can get a recurrence risk. And so there is some risk of that. And then this could be a very uh, frustrating problem for men to have some narrowing. Uh, and because the open surgery to revise that is very problematic to go back after surgery or radiation into that area. It's very inaccessible compared to the rest of the urethra. So there's some challenges with that. Uh, just recently, a new treatment has emerged as showing promise. And I just did one such procedure today. Uh, and that's for recurrent bladder neck contractures where you incise it and you inject an agent called mitomycin C, which has been used in neurology in the past for the treatment of bladder cancer, which is an agent that goes in the bladder. It's been using other specialties, such as esophageal strictures, to, and it's been showing good promise. And in some studies, it's been shown that even when somebody's had multiple incisions of their bladder neck and just had it come back over and over, when you add the injection of the agent through a needle that goes through the scope into the scar, in addition to cutting it open, it's been shown on early results, not really reproduced by many centers, but through people I know in and I trust them. I think they're honest people. And it's been shown good promise, and because of that, I've started to do that also. And I don't have a huge experience, nobody really does, uh, with long-term results. Uh, I can say that I've been very initially encouraged by this. So this is a new treatment uh, that's just become uh, uh, more popular just in the past year. Uh, now, when somebody has a bladder neck contracture and a nervous problem, that's a Narrowing. That's a real problem because you can't practically reconstruct something like that uh, unless you remove the whole area. And by definition, that'll be incontinent because you're addressing both areas that are continence mechanisms. And then you have the issue of an artificial sphincter. So that's a, a lot to consider. And when somebody has that problem, especially if they have medical problems or they don't want to have multiple procedures where there's a certain risk of going through a major surgery, one option in some of these most complex cases including cases where the bladder itself is damaged, just to have what's called a urinary diversion. And a urinary diversion can be where you take a piece of bowel from the bladder to the skin. And if the bladder is contracted, you can augment it, which means you add a little bit of the bowel to make the bladder a little bit bigger so you don't have that high pressure and you increase the capacity. And then what a patient will do is take a catheter that they keep with them in a little plastic bag, let's say in their pocket, and maybe a certain number of times a day, they'll go to the restroom, insert that through the opening in the abdomen. It's really small. And then through the pressure of inserting that catheter, it creates a channel in a space where that catheter goes into the bladder and they empty it out. But between the catheterization, there's no leakage. There's no issues of blockage. Uh, 
uh, there's no obstruction. And that's a very reasonable option in some cases. Now, is that a wonderful option? No, not to the man who just wants to urinate like he did before all this happened. Certainly not. But what I want to conclude with is when I see patients, sometimes I can offer them, like the man who eight years now has had no problems, even though he had a very severe recurrent stricture after radiation in the external human seed. I can offer them a very normal life. Some patients, I can't, that's not a realistic expectation. So all I can really do is make sure I get all the information by doing imaging, getting the results, and then going over each option. And if I can't find the best option that would be normal, perhaps we can come up with an option that's at least better than their current situation. It might be better than having a catheter and going into the urethra. It may be better than having a supercubic tube or two directly in the bladder. It may be better than coming to the emergency room once a week and 10 out of 10 pain because the bladder's full and the patient can't urinate. Uh, so sometimes we can make patients relatively normal with regard to function. Uh, but in other cases, we can uh, offer them a better situation. If we can't, at least we can help them understand that, you know, that their situation is something where they're not overlooking uh, another option, where they are really uh, being managed with the best situation at this particular time. Uh, but uh, not to be negative, uh, many of these problems uh, don't have the prostate cancer treatment. I don't see them. I only really see the complications. And with uh, many of the people who even have these complications, which are relatively rare, uh, we can improve their quality of life, uh, sometimes considerably. Uh, so I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, Paul, do you have any take questions? I made a mistake for a minute ago. I don't want you to step down, Dr. Gellman. I want you to stay there. We'll take questions here. When I want you to step down or when you come down, is afterwards, some people, after you've answered questions and the presentation is done, we have some people that try and run up and ask you questions up here. I don't want that to happen, people get hurt, whatever, but answer the questions, we'll line up here, and then if you have something later that we haven't addressed, Dr. Gelman has to wrap up his equipment here. If you'll wait outside for him out in the lobby area, when he walks out, if he's willing, uh, you might catch him for a moment or two on his way out to his car. But he's got to do his wrap up here. I don't want him to in be inundated, but I do want you to be able to answer your questions, ask your questions here. We, I will give you a mic and we'll take it from there. Does that sound reasonable, Dr. Gellman? Sure. Okay. I'm sorry I made that mistake before. Anybody has any questions? Want to come on up here? Jim. How you doing, Doc? I don't need a mic. Yeah, yeah, you do because that's the only way it goes on the tape. Oh, okay. Um, they took out my prostate fourth April, and it was 157 grams. So they ended up uh, cutting the urine. I was in the hospital a little bit longer than I was in 12 days. So um, the incontinence is uh, zero. I used to pass for about three days and. I go to the gym, I do a lot of things, I'm a contractor. Matter of fact, we do uh, about three million dollars work at your campus. What scares me is, uh, it will be four months, right in a week. So, uh, is there a chance I'm gonna be normal without, because I went to that Boston Medical Group, and uh, the mixed results is, uh, Nobody really has taught, us how, taught me how to do it correctly. That applicator, uh, the times that I have failed and they've been embarrassing, is more applicator because I, I now have the courage to just use the needle without the applicator. Okay. Uh, you mean the, the pre-filled syringe? Yeah, you? I can fill the syringe up and mm -hmm. I use that trimix and sadly that put me in the hospital with that four hour and everybody came by to see who I was. That was embarrassing. So now I'm just on a poly, whatever it is, it's just a very simple thing. And uh, I'm getting very good results when it works, when it actually applies itself. So I'm worried, I would, I would like to use the Viagra all the time. And then somebody told me now I can't use that injection but four times a week and I haven't been told that. Actually, I haven't been told that 
I could do it maybe within 12 hours or 16 hours. And, uh, but mostly I just want to know if I can, if in two months I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night and I'm going to be just normal. That would be a blessing. Well, uh, you're, you had prostate surgery in April, and it's now July. Uh, there's always a very good chance, especially somebody who's young and relatively good health, to have return of erectile function during the one year subsequent to surgery. In fact, if you said to me that your, your injection therapy was very uh, intolerable, you tried oral medication and it didn't work. Uh, you tried the injections and you just don't want to do that. And you heard about this implant. Uh, I would say it would be wrong for you to even be offered an implant right now because of the fact that there's a very reasonable chance you could have some improvement of your erectile function over this coming year. So that's an encouraging thing, whether I could give you an idea about what's going to happen in your particular case or anybody's. Nobody has that crystal ball benefit. Uh, but uh, yeah, but in, in terms of treatment, even though there's a chance of recovery, what people are doing more and more as a trend, those who treat prostate cancer, is they're doing, they're even calling it uh, rehabilitation, if you will, very that term, uh, to try to promote blood flow to the penis and encourage early return of function by treating that rather aggressive. And some people routinely put people on oral medications just almost as like a protocol, if you will, after prostate surgery. Since I don't do prostate surgery, I don't you know, put people on those protocols, but I know that that happens. Uh, but uh, in terms of the injections, yeah, one potential complication is priapism, which is a, an abnormally long erection. And um, in terms of the technique, I don't know how well you were counseled or if you demonstrated the ability to inject properly before you were given the medicine to go home. Uh, but that's, that's the best way to. to treat that uh, uh, particular problem using injection therapy and, and to approach that is to be educated in the proper use. Any other follow-up on that? Um, did I answer you have a problem with Viagra and the shot at the same time? Well, in terms of uh, Viagra at the, the same time, most people say for reasons I don't quite understand. So that it's considered you're supposed to be using one and not the other, and not, not so that's what people say. But people also tell me they use both and there's some benefit to them. And they don't seem to have so many problems with that. <clears throat> so I get the feeling that most people think based on things that they've either read or published or believe that they shouldn't be recommending it. But the reality is people do use them on their own combination and don't seem to have too much problems with it. Maybe there's just some indication or reason on, on the product or brochure or whatever that, that motivates people to not want to have people do it. But it, 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 but there are people who do have some benefit from using both at the same time. But generally, though, if you're eating, if you're using injection therapy and it's not working, you know, my own approach would be to try to find a better way to get the injection therapy to work because if you're doing that particular medicine and, and having the invasiveness of that procedure, your, your report should be to have that work in itself. So I wouldn't say use, use the inadequate dose of the wrong injection technique and then use the Viagra to try to boost it to compensate for that. You know, for the first thing you might want to do, or in general from what you described, is to just really make sure you're injecting properly with the proper medicine at the proper dose. In terms of the frequency injections that you mentioned, you know, some people say don't do it more than once every other uh, day. The more needles you put in your penis, there is a risk of scarring, of course. Uh, but nobody, uh, I didn't think I was really quantitated that and said, oh, the risk is this. If you do it, you know, after 12 hours, and it's this much lower if you do it uh, every two days. But most people would say once every other day is a, is a very reasonable frequency. Is there a, uh, yeah. uh, and there's a you mentioned scarring between the urethra and the bladder, uh, and there's quite a bit of scarring where there's a very weak stream, and 
something that's done that could have been scarring, is there a chance that the uh, could be incontinence made in sphincter muscle damage in some, some way? For which problem? For the scarring, it's, I had flush technique where they joined the, the urethra to the bladder, mm -hmm. and I was told that I had quite a bit of scar tissue there. Now, I, I guess that scar tissue has gotten worse because the stream has gotten very, very low, mm -hmm. and in fact, sometimes there's, there's a rush to get to the bathroom. I'm not incontinent yet, but uh, so I'm thinking of having something done there where I can clear that scar tissue. But I'm concerned that uh, sphincter must could be damaged. Is that well, there are some people who have obstruction, and yes, they're and treating the obstruction. They're thinking, well, then that's going to make the leakage, and I don't want that. And, and that's reasonable, of course. But one thing you, that I would tell people who have that concern or have some leakage and don't want it to be worse is the way I view this. And it's, if you have obstruction, it's important to know the, the details. Like, if you really think you have obstruction, do you know how narrow your urethra is? Do you know where the narrow is? Just uh, the, the caliber of a urethral stricture can be quantified. And, and often it's in French size, which is no near circumference. Now, when somebody really has obstruction, and you're worried about the, then you have to just weigh risks and benefits. If you're obstructed, do you know the risks of obstruction? And you may think your risk is, or the problem with that is you have to put up with a slow stream. Maybe it takes a little bit longer. Maybe you have to go a little bit more often out really slow and you'd like it to come out faster. If that was the only concern, then I think it would be reasonable for many people to say, well, so it takes longer, big deal. So maybe the, the, so the next number of times you urinate, uh, that's, that you have to take longer. So what? Why, why bother with that? But the reality is, that's the least of the problems. When somebody's obstructed, because when you're obstructed, when you have a blockage anywhere in your urethra, if you're choosing <coughs> observation, which you're doing now, if you're not being treated, you have to understand the risks of observation. The risk of observation of obstruction is not just that it takes longer to urinate. The risks are that every time your bladder squeezes, it has to squeeze harder to overcome the blockage. And as it has to squeeze harder, it can become thicker, it can become less able to empty, it can cause back pressure into the prostate, go except when you've had your prostate removed, but uh, it can also cause damage uh, up to the kidneys in particular, uh, which is called reflux. It's where you when know, your bladder squeezes and pops out towards the kidney, you can have kidney failure. Uh, you can actually have outcouchings of the bladder called diverticula. So these are all the risks of untreated obstruction. So I tell people that <coughs> it's, uh, you can have more problems from untreated obstruction than from leakage. And so I wouldn't suggest in general that people allow themselves to know to be obstructed because they're uh, afraid of leakage. I mean, yes, it can happen, and you can choose to do that. You can choose to, to observe the stricture, but in order to make an informed dis decision, even for observation, you need to know the risks of the treatment, but also the risks of observation. And when I counsel people, I always mention the risks of doing nothing benefits. There's benefits. There's no complications. It's free. But there's risks sometimes too. And it's important to understand those risks. Right. Anybody else at this time? Okay, we'd like to thank you again, Dr. Gelman. It was very, very informative. We'd like to have the opportunity to invite you back sometime because I'm sure there were some people that weren't able to make it tonight that would like to come in and hear you again. In the meantime, what we'd like to do is have anybody that has any personal questions to meet Dr. Gelman after he wraps up his stuff here. And he'll, he'll be wrapping up his own equipment and getting ready to leave. We don't want anybody to get hurt in here in the meantime. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Dr. Gelman. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. Your office is in Orange? Yes. And do you work out of a particular hospital? UC Irvine. UC Irvine. I could do that. I sent Larry Tano out for it. Okay. Do you happen to have a card so when I put your name on the video? I get a
it's outdated though. My yeah, it's, you know, I've had several people ask me, did you bring any with you? Any business cards? I mean, I just need it for the spelling of the name. Yeah, we don't need the American Express card. <laughs> I took them out because I had something I wrote on. Updating it. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking at it. Can... Okay. Think it with my name. If you just type my name. You can just Google Dr. Gelman and you'll find all this. You'll find everything really, really easily. That's the nice thing about the internet. Is it? Is it? You know, people send me their CV and I already have it off the internet. Like you, Gelman UCI, Gelman UEFRA, or whatever you want to find. And, uh, Gelman? Gelman. Gelman. That's it, Gelman. Oh, okay. 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 No, we just started on campus about a month and a half ago. I think. We have a $3 million construction contract there that I think will probably be. I got five of my employees on this campus. The, the medical center campus? City of Irvine and that. I think what we're doing mostly now is that area in front of the hospital. Which is, I'll ask the I don't know said that. That's a huge prospect, huh? Yeah. And Dr. Wilson. Seven centimeters. Dr. Wilson did a robotic. He said he did. He went way out of his way on those nerves because he knew that this was still kind of important. Mentally, I, I, you know, I'm not Yeah, but you always have that uh, assurance that there's a very real chance of recovery over time because it's been so little time. Very reasonable. Very reasonable. I think it's actually quite remarkable. Yeah. Very reasonable. Yeah. 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 Yeah.